Jesus is quoting the scriptures and Satan is quoting the scriptures. If I was there when, when Satan tempted Jesus, what would I say? Who would I believe? Right. Satan or Jesus? Yeah. Mm. No. Let me ask you the same thing, Brother Vlad. So you have Jesus quoting scripture and you have Satan quoting scripture. Fast forward 2,000 years and you've got the Watchtower quoting scripture. So who am I going to believe? Jesus or the Watchtower? All right, welcome back to the channel, guys. This is going to be part 12 of our uh, critique of this secret elders meeting. Um, I'm thinking we're, I'm thinking this is the end, guys. I'm thinking that we're going to wrap up this video today. Uh, so I am very excited because I'm looking forward to getting into some other important subjects when it comes to the teachings of the Watchtower and the Jehovah's Witnesses. So um, go ahead and, per the usual, grab a beverage. And let's hop in. So, and that was meeting in homes. So, so then it tells us one thing, that Jehovah reveals what we can understand. Now, if was that change to take place in the 40s, nobody would have taken. But in 74, yes. But there were some that could not take it. And they were left. Just as it was in the first century. It talks about the Imanel and Philet. Where were they? They were Dima. What was he? Work along with Paul. But what Okay, I just want <clears throat> I want to touch on something real quick because uh, Brother Vlad says they're talking about like the governing body and, and how it used to be and how it is now and basically changes in the organization is what Isaac is pointing out and Brother Vlad is saying Jehovah reveals things when we're ready and he said you know when we're we came up with the body of elders in the 1974 if it would have happened in the 1940s no one would have accepted it and they would have been left behind. So basically, like, it would have been a splinter group of, of heretics, according to the, the new rules, right? The problem is, is what, yes, we do get deeper interpretation of the same truth that's in the Bible, okay? So through years of study and different scholars and all this other stuff, we might have deeper uh, or better understandings of what the scripture says, but I, I think it's... I think what the witnesses are doing, what Brother Vlad in this instance is doing, is creating a safety net um, for themselves. And that safety net is basically, oh, as our interpretation of Scripture gets better, we can make changes without the old thing being bad. So basically, you know, they're the truth. They're synonymous with truth. And when they go ahead and make a change in their organization, um, they don't have to say, well, that was, that was once a lie or it was bad. Um, and this new thing is truth. All they have to say is, well, our our interpretation of Scripture is deepening. Jehovah is revealing more stuff to us, and now, you know, this new thing is the way to go. So it's a it's a nice safety net. I notice a lot of high control groups have those sort of things built into their teachings, um, and Jehovah's Witnesses. I, sorry, I should say the governing body and Watchtower is no stranger to having a safety net like that. All right, well, let's keep going. What happened later on? He said he left. Why do you think he left? He didn't like certain adjustments. That's exactly how Franz came, even though he wrote, he was one of the main uh, contributors to aid to Bible understanding. So his knowledge of the Bible really took him astray. Mm -hmm. Well, did it take him astray? Or yes, yes. I, I mean, from what I've read, it's not so much that it took him astray, but he He could not, he could not it. accept changes. He could not accept that. Yeah, he said, yeah. all of a sudden, he said, why only 144,000 should go to heaven? Now, mm -hmm. if you really think, come on, man. Well, that's a figure, that's a literal number with a figurative. Brother Vlad just pulled a, a Joe Biden. Come on, man. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, listen to that. Okay. Um, if you're not in the know, Franz, why can't I remember his first name? Raymond Franz, um, he, Brother Vlad just made the accusation that his knowledge of the Bible is actually what took him away from truth. 
listen to that. His knowledge of the Bible is actually what took him away from truth because he couldn't accept changes. No, I believe Raymond Franz couldn't accept things that were unscriptural and changes to scripture. I think that's what he couldn't accept. I think that's what his crisis of conscience was. And you have to think about it too. This was one of eight of the governing body. He was definitely in the anointed class. He was definitely one of the 144,000 that the Watchtower teaches is going to, um, yeah, going to rule in heaven, right? And everyone else is like a second class citizen. So think about it. Why would Raymond Franz, if he's one of the anointed, and he's one of the 144,000 that's going to rule in heaven over the rest of the second class citizens, even speak up if he's already in that class, okay? Like, <laughs> the reason he's speaking up is because when he read scripture, he's like, whoa, whoa, wait, why are we teaching this when it's not scriptural? That's the problem that he had. You have to also think, again, he was one of the, the eight, so he's anointed, and yet he becomes a heretic. So think about that. Someone who is anointed, they have the heavenly hope, right? And they can even fall from grace. So there's no security in the teachings of the Watchtower. What I mean by that is you literally have to do, 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 do work. And hopefully all of your good works will stack up one day. And then Jehovah will smile on you during Armageddon. And he won't Thanos you out of existence. Um, which I don't think he can do. The the Jehovah of Watchtower is a very petty and small and powerless God. Okay, um, so let's <laughs> let's keep going. Sorry, guys. It's a little, 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 little bit. The book of Revelation. Going back to the main idea. Right. If you go into to first century, Jesus had the hardest time to convince people that some will go to heaven. I mean, 2000 after, you can't stop them. Everybody wants to go to heaven. <laughs> the, organization, the organization taught that up until the 30s, no, though. So, but understand, I mean, these people that came into the truth, they came with a background from religious background that they had. Right. So it was very hard for some of them, and for some even today. Well, every anointed, every anointed one I've met can't, comes from Christendom. Every person I've met that's anointed it had always, it was born with the hope that they're going to heaven. I've never met someone that's anointed that's that was born into it. You know. Can we just point out real quick that the 144,000 are supposed to be virgin men from the 12 different tribes of Jude, like the 12 different tribes of Israel. Like virgin men from the 12 tribes of Israel. Like just think about it. So when you have sister, you know, What's her name? And she's claim, you know, she's taking of the wine and the bread, and she's one of the anointed. Uh, is she a virgin Jewish man from one of the twelve tribes of Israel? We think not. So, um, is it literal or is it symbolic? That's what you have to. That's what you have to figure out in Scripture. Okay, let's keep going. The one oh, star is showing Sunday. I think it's the best way that is approached the subject. It's uh, how do you respond? to the calling that Jehovah puts before mankind. And in other words, we are all sinner, all condemned to dying, and that's it. Now, all of a sudden, Jehovah said, I'm, I'm going to re redeem you. Now, do you say, well, I'm going to get out of prison, but only if you send me to Naples. If Jehovah is going to say, no, I'll send you to Fort Myers. <laughs> do you have a saying on that? He said, no, 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 just get me out of here. <laughs> just get me out of here. That's why I think... Okay, and then the other thing I want to point out too, um, he's talking about how, you know, Jesus was having a hard time. This was back before I interrupted the first time. Jesus was having a hard time convincing anyone that they wanted to go to heaven in the first century. And now everyone wants to go to heaven. He's saying 2,000 years later. I think, yes, some tradition has entered into the church. And when I say tradition, I'm talking like extra biblical teachings or beliefs have entered into the, the church or the body of Christ many times. Um, and then there needs to be pushback, righteous pushback from the body uh, to be able to uncover those lies and things like that. When people say that they're going to heaven, I just think it's a misunderstanding. They don't really understand what the second coming is going to look like or what the millennial reign is going to look like. So as I understand it, Eden, the word Eden literally translates as high place. Um, and if you imagine two spheres, like you have heaven and earth, Eden was the overlapping of those two uh, two spheres. So 
So God was literally walking in the garden with Adam and Eve, like his presence was there, right? And then when sin entered the picture, it took those two spheres apart, right? And then the only way that those spheres could overlap was through uh, sacrifice, atonement for sins, and that was, or the tabernacle or the temple, right? Um, and hopefully I'm getting some of this correct. But when it says, behold, I am making all things new, and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and uh, Jerusalem will, will it'll, there'll be like a new Jerusalem, a city that comes down, right? So the idea is that those two spheres are going to overlap once again, and everything's going to be completely made new. So when people say I'm going to heaven one day, they're not walking around with like clouds over their feet and they're just not eating and they're, you know, flying. It's nothing like that. You still have a digestive system. You're still going to be uh, working on things. You're still going to be learning. So heaven, yes, in a sense, you will have a perfect glorified body, but it's not at all how it's depicted in like Hollywood movies. Okay, hopefully that made sense. Let's keep going. The way it's presented in the Watchtower, mm. it's excellent because people start thinking, oh, why do I want to go to heaven? Well, that's how I grew up, that I go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So those are the changes that we always should be willing to take when there is scriptural basis for it. And some don't. That's the way it was it's, in the first century. Everyone's going to read a scripture differently. That's everyone's going to interpret it differently because it touches the heart different. Yeah. True. Can you imagine Jesus is quoting the scriptures and Satan is quoting the scriptures? Now, if you were there, if I would, honestly, God, I think many times reading that Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, if I was there when, when Satan tempted Jesus, what would I say? Who would I believe? Right. Satan or Jesus? Yeah. Mm. Now, Let me ask you the same thing, Brother Vlad. So you have Jesus quoting scripture and you have Satan quoting scripture. Fast forward 2,000 years, and you've got the Watchtower quoting scripture. So who am I going to believe, Jesus or the Watchtower? That's all. Do you think that is that issue stopped? No, it's still going on. Actually, now is intensifying because we have to see everything in the scripture based on Genesis 3.15. If we lose track of that, then we are lost. Yeah. That's why the adjustment even in the Watchtower about a year ago or two, when he says the world power, he said, forget about world powers. You have to see them in line of Bible. That's Genesis 3.15. It's not that were only seven world powers. There were hundreds yeah, of them. Tons of world powers. Yep. Now the same is only with, that's the same with year yeah. 607. Yeah. That's the same with the year 1914. Right. If you see it in Jehovah's timetable, then you make you can come up with a good conclusion, and we should. This timetable thing that he loves. Otherwise, you can write hundreds of articles, and you can publish them on Google. He said, "Well, I look back in history, and that's how the first book that I've read. You know, the truth will set you free. You know, at that time, even the year seventy-five was not clear. It was in nineteen seventy-two. Mm -hmm. Then the chronology was re-examined. He said, "Well, we lost three years." Okay, real quick. So, Brother Vlad right now is rattling off all these years, and some of these years don't make sense to you if you're not, uh, or ever were, a Jehovah's Witness. So he's saying 1914, 1918, 1972, 74. What's he, what is he referencing? He's referencing the times when the organization has tried to say, this will be the end of days. This is going to be when Armageddon happens. Jesus in scripture says, no one but the fathers knows the day or the hour, not even the sun. Yet the watchtower and the governing body has figured it out multiple times. They've predicted the end so many times and they just keep moving the year around. And brother Vlad is talking about it like it's no big deal. We just, um, you know, we're, pff, we're just sort of messing up here and there. We guessed the end was here. We guessed the end was here. Jesus said no one would know, but we're still trying to figure it out. Now, I will say as of late, they've tried to back off of naming exact years. But I think even recently, like within the past couple of months, because of the 2020 election, they're trying to say that this, you know, guys, this is it. This truly is the end of days. And this is what they keep doing. They keep trying to get people scared. Keep, keep being a good boy and girl. 
Keep doing your work. Don't stray away from the organization. Don't listen to evil apostates because this is the end. Armageddon is around the corner. And if you stray now, after so many years, then you're just going to be killed at Armageddon. So that's that's what they do. Um, oh, boy. All right, let's keep going. Yeah. So the, the point is we have to understand why these changes took place in the organization. And it's, it's a not a surprise. Well, it's not this. It's because the organization is a false religion. That's why all these changes keep occurring. Okay. Surprise. And it will be. It will be Jesus actually. To me, the most surprising statement that Jesus said, he said, it is impossible not to be stumbling points. I said, come on, Jesus. You are calling me to follow you, and you are saying you are going to have stumbling blocks on this road. Yeah. Does, does that make sense to you? He said, oh, oh, I better be careful. Yeah. I better. He said, I'm not saying it, it's a Luke chapter 13. Right. He said, it is impossible. But do you imagine, if you really get it, impossible. So there will be in the organization. Now the question is, how would I as an individual respond to the changes that come up? Mm. That's the issue. That's the only issue. The rest of it is irrelevant. There will be stumbling blocks for some. Okay, here's another thing that he's doing. He's doing some wordplay here. He's trying to say that, you know, Jesus predicted that there would be stumbling blocks in the future. Um, and then, sorry about that. Um, he's predicting that, you know, Jesus said that there would be stumbling blocks in the future. So what... Brother Vlad is doing is saying, okay, this, this, all these mistakes and false teachings and false predictions and stuff, those were just stumbling blocks. Let's just cover that thing with that word. You know, that's a stumbling block. And look, our organization is making the proper changes and uh, we're all good here. Nothing to see here. Again, the organization started about 150 years ago. They're a splinter group off of the Millerites, who still exist today, um, also from the same exact group where the Mormons came from. So, uh, there was, let's just say that there was uh, some sort of spiritual war going on 150 years ago, and there were some principalities who really wanted to make their own uh, religions, and that was the time uh, when it was ripe to do so. All right, so let's uh, pause it here, and then we'll keep going. And the Bible says clearly, for those loving Jehovah, there is no stumbling blocks. Now, now, now which one is true? <laughs> one it says that it's impossible not to have stumbling blocks mm -hmm. and the other one says there is no stumbling blocks. So it means it all depends on me. If I have the right attitude, Jehovah will make sure that I understand and I will have no stumbling blocks. Right. If Jehovah sees in me a double heart, then he said, okay, then you are going to stumble. You are going to get up. You're um, I'm seriously contemplating putting a timestamp into the video and literally putting, if you would like to skip Brother Vlad's weird rant, go to this point in the video. Because, man, he is all over the place. He is just everywhere right now. It's like he's trying to recap the, the entire Judicial Committee meeting in, in just these last six minutes. Um, sorry, let's keep going. You're going to fall. You're going to get up. You're going to fall. And even that, he allows it seven times. That means there is no time limit, as long as we get up. Yeah. Right. No, I, I, so, I understand. So, yeah. so don't be bothered by the changes in the organizations. The ones that are there, they are going to give an account to Jehovah. Well, I hope so, because... There's it's, no, no, <laughs> it's for sure. Well, uh, yeah, it's for it's sure. Because the, as sure it's, as it is for myself, I will give an account. Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, each one will give an account to the one that will stand before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Each, so, it, we have four people here. Yeah. It doesn't say that I'm going to respond for you or you for me. But so quick question, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, according to scripture, who's the one who does the judging on the day of judgment? Is it Jehovah or is it Jesus? Now, being a Trinitarian, I know the answer to that question, um, but it's right there in scripture. And I don't think that you have to be a Trinitarian to know the answer to that. Um, but it's, you know, it, it sort of helps with the whole Jehovah thing. Anyways, we'll, uh, we'll keep going. We're going to keep trying to slug through this. I would have to even account to Jehovah, you know? 
them. So yes. look at from that perspective. Mm. Then everything changes. Because then you start thinking, what's that nonsense on seeing? If you punch JW.org, there are how many sites? Oh my goodness, there, mm -hmm. there is one official site and then a yeah. bunch of others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, is it one? Okay, real quick, and I, I want to do another thing um, before we continue on. I just want to, because remember he was talking about stumbling blocks, and I was talking about how he was using that phrase, stumbling block, to cover over top of the sins of the, the Jehovah's Witnesses past, and, and just scoot it away. Now the other thing that he likes to do, or that he just did, is he said, don't be bothered by the changes in the organization. Don't be bothered by that. Those people are going to give an account to Jehovah. Listen, it's, it's one thing to be bothered uh, about a doctrine that really means nothing, okay? But it's a completely different issue when someone in your family has died because of a false teaching. And I'm not being hyperbolic right now, and I'm not being extreme. There are literally people who grew up in this organization who have lost their lives because of the false teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses. They had false teaching when it came to organ transplants. They used to consider that cannibalism. Uh, they had false teachings when it comes to accepting, still have false teachings when it comes to accepting blood transfusions. So three witnesses will die today because of that false doctrine. So I just want to, when, when he says, don't be bothered with the changes, that's really, it, it's really bringing down the severity of what has happened in the past with Watchtower. And when it comes to uh, the governing body taking any credit for the sins of their false teachings, they don't do it. In fact, a lot of times what ends up happening, when there's any consequences that, that end up being really, really big, let's just take 1975, for example. They predicted that that was going to be the end of days. Armageddon is coming, right? So a bunch of people sold their homes so that they could go into the full-time preaching work. Um, some other people like made some bad investments. They bought boats and they were going to enjoy the rest of the year of 1974 because 1975 was going to be the end some people didn't have children because you know let's just say it was the whenever they were predicting it and you had 1975 well i'm not going to have kids some people literally got to the point where 1975 came and went and now they were uh, sterile unfortunately they couldn't have children because they waited too long so there are huge consequences and the reason i bring any of that stuff up is because instead of the governing body taking credit for the year 1975 and that false prediction, they turned around and wrote in their publications that some of the brothers and sisters in the organization got too overzealous. So what did they do? They turned around and they blamed it on the people that they were leading. Sounds like a wonderful, God-led, spirit-directed organization to me. Um, and that's one example of many. So let's keep it going. To waste my time with those? Start but thinking. Depends on you. Yeah. Start thinking, what do you want to get? Right. If I want to get with Jehovah, then I know this is the official side. Because I know I have not seen any other group or organization explaining better the Bible, applying better the Bible, or striving, making every effort to follow the Bible. There is it. Or accomplishing. I bet um, Mormons would say the same thing. I bet any any cult group would say, I don't see anybody doing it better than we're doing it when they actually haven't looked outside of their own organization. You are not allowed to go onto other religious websites. Like, d guys, you're trapped in a mind bubble. If, you, if you're still a Jehovah's Witness and you're watching this right now, you know what I'm saying is correct. You know that if you go to apostate websites or anything that isn't from JW.org, those are Satan's websites. You're literally told that you can't research your organization. Oh, goodness sakes. Accomplishing anything. Accomplishing right now. I see in your notes just as it doing. was in the first century. Was Judah good. was the first one and then a bunch of others. Mm -hmm. That's very clear in the Bible. Do you think that group ended? No. You'll be like that until the end of thousand years. Mm -hmm. Even then. Here we go again. Typical Jehovah's Witness response. Look at our works. Look at our works. Look at how nice they are. Isn't it nice? What did Jesus say? You're like salt that's lost its saltiness. What do you do with salt that's, that's lost its saltiness? It's good for nothing. You throw it outdoors so that it's trampled underfoot. And that's what the organization is. It is salty 
<laughs> it's saltless salt. I mean, it, it's just a works-based organization and that is your way to uh, salvation. Even then, there'll be a bunch of them. So don't be bothered. Look to Jehovah, look to his arrangement. Then you're never going to get lost. Yeah, I, I tried. I I really did try. Um, but... Well, did you try? Yeah, 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 yeah. You, um, no, uh, Isaac, mm. you... It's, it's your decision. Right. Yep. Your decision. Well, I, I mean, I can... I, yeah. I, I'll, it'll make my it'll make it easier for you you know you tonight if I can just you know you'll you'll know you'll know what my stand is when I'm fin I just got a couple okay. lines yeah. I gotta read and okay. some of it's gonna be painful but I, I won't be insult I hopefully won't be insulting any of you. Is this your final letter? This is just me talking. Okay. This is okay. this is me yeah, thank you. giving my yeah. mm -hmm. so for the duration of this meeting you may okay strap in guys because we are about to get into. Isaac's letter to the organization um, and look at how happy Brother Precious is. He's like, is this your final letter? Because he just, he feels the end is nigh and he's going to get to go home soon. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing right now. This is a very serious moment, but you can tell here in the last parts of the end, again, um, Isaac is an atheist at this point. They're talking to him about scriptural, spiritual things. And um, it's it's just falling on deaf ears. I, again, there's you can't point to virtues in the organization um, that are scripture based, even if the organization gets certain things right. And I can't honestly sit back and say everything in it is bad, or else it wouldn't be attractive or appealing to anyone. There were good things that I, I had happen to me growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, or or good things that influenced my wife in a positive way, but. Isaac is about to get into his speech. It's fantastic. It is a fantastic letter. Um, of course, there's going to be things in there that I disagree with. But like I said, uh, strap in. I'm going to try to not interrupt because this is, I want this to be his monologue. And I want it to sort of have the same weight on you guys that it has on these elders here. Um, I, I may chip in here or there. But anyways, let's, uh, let's get into it. I've been exposed to information that is likely never been brought forward to you or any other active Jehovah's Witness. I choose to present these facts to you in this manner because I was raised in a religion that calls itself the truth. For a religious group or any other authority to hold back truths and facts from its subordinates, subordinates is number two on the list of tactics used by cults, according to psychologists. North Korea is a perfect example of how a high-control authority can manipulate its people into believing anything the leaders say is the truth. Example is Kim Jong-un is considered a god among all North Koreans, because that's what they've been told their entire lives. Without any outside information or freedom of thought outside the parameters the authority dictates. Anyone who challenges this alleged truth is silenced. Likewise, the Watchtower and the governing body have commanded all Jehovah's Witnesses to never research about the organization. Avoid apostates in their books, their websites, etc. Only read the publications we print for you to read the Bible. Avoid higher education. If this religion is the truth, shouldn't it be able to stand up against any deep analysis of its own history and its policies and procedures? During the times of the medieval inquisitions, the church tortured, murdered, forced confessions from heretics, refused to allow a difference in opinion or even a sliver of scrutiny against the church. Similarly, today, any who question the teachings of the Watchtower and the Governing Body are likewise silenced, labeled apostates, mentally diseased, or heretics. The decision for me to no longer attend meetings was a result of countless hours of research, self-reflection, and numerous phone calls to the Watchtower Service Department itself. I know the consequences of my actions and words spoken to you here today, and it's a decision that has cost me my marriage, my family, and all those who have ever been close to me in my life. The 2009 Awake says that someone shouldn't have to choose between their family and their beliefs. It appears what's written in the magazines and what's exercised differs greatly. I knew the world I was walking into, but it is a world that lives in reality. Tonight you've been told the many double standards, secrets, flip-flops, doctrines, all sanctioned by the governing body who am our God's sole channel on earth. Exposing the Jehovah's Witnesses as just another high control group governed by men on this earth. Which has led me to ask the age-old question, did, do, did, did God create man or did man create God? 
answer your question, Isaac, God created man. <laughs> Just to let you know. Um, okay. So, like I said, I, I want to interrupt very, very little, but uh, you can see how, like, like he's gone back into into way in the past to like when the Catholic Church was in complete and total control, and um, you know they they were basically like above the kings of the world. You know, like what the Pope said was was above what kings would say, and kings were supposed to be ordained by God. And he was saying, you know, that anyone who spoke out against the Church, aka the Catholic Church, in this sense was branded a heretic and tortured and killed. And yes, there have been terrible things done in history in the name of Christianity. There's been terrible things that have been done in history that have been done in the name of Islam. There's been terrible things that have been done in history. In fact, some of the, the actual largest homicide or genocide, sorry, that has ever occurred was under Joseph Stalin in communist Russia. And he was not, not just an atheist. He was an anti-theist. He was angry with God. In fact, before he drew his last breath, he shook his fist in the air. So to me, that doesn't seem like so much of an atheist as someone who is more than likely, uh, they know God exists. They, they know that God exists. And his last action on this planet was to shake his, his fist towards the heavens. I mean, that's, that's crazy stuff. Um, okay, so we're going to continue on. Keep letting him read his letter. All right, let's hop into it. Three... Two, one. The discoveries I've made about the religion I was raised in have helped me open my eyes to a larger truth about God himself. None of us here grew up in India worshipping Ganesha, Shiva, or Vishnu, did we? It can be fair to say that we are all atheists against these gods. If we grew up in ancient Greece, we would have been raised by our parents worshipping Zeus and the other gods of Mount Olympus. Molecular bi biologist Richard Dawkins says we are all atheists about most of the gods that man has ever believed in. Some of us just have chosen to move one god further. Yeah, that's like a popular thing that um, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, they like to say, you know, if, if you grew up in India, then you'd believe in Krishna. Or if, if you were in Greece, you'd believe in Zeus. You know, um, it's a weak argument, to be honest. Because <laughs> honestly, you could... you could uh, Let's turn that around. Uh... By his own standard, if Hitchens or Dawkins was born into an atheist household, then he would have no choice but to be an atheist. And then how could he believe that what he believes is true? Because he's just a product of where he was born, right? So all you have to do a lot of times is just turn claims on themselves and see if they make sense. Uh, that's what we call the roadrunner tactic. All right, so <laughs> the claim is that if you were born in any other part of the world, you would, you would worship that part of the world's religion, right? Um, okay, so if you don't believe in God, then the claim can be applied to itself. If you were born in an atheist household, then you're just a product of where you were born. Doesn't hold water. All right, let's keep going. Judeo-Christian God Yahweh, whom you call Jehovah, who receives no worship, fear, penance, or form of submission or supplication from me any longer. The God is no more real to me than the other pagan deities I've mentioned. Looking at this world now from the perspective of a secular human being, I can say now that I truly feel a sense of purpose in my life. That purpose is to live my life. Live it free from dogmatic authority written by desert nomads from the Bronze Age and from the New Age interpretation of these ancient texts. We are now unshackled from the enslavement of religious dogma. Our hearts and minds will feel a sense of true freedom and enlightenment unknown to many on this earth, although the numbers of us are awakening and increasing in vast numbers every day. For a religious person to say all humanity must to look and abide by the Bible for morals and direction in life is the most absurd statement to me. To the vast majority of free thinkers... Mm, okay, there's a lot to unpack here real quick. Uh, firstly, he says, now that I'm released from the shackles of religion, I can go and live my life. I actually have a true sense of purpose. Okay, well, to be honest, like, let's just, let's just think this through, Okay. Apparently, according to science, in like 9,000 years or something like that, maybe it's 90,000. I can't remember the number. I won't be around that long. <laughs> so, apparently, at some point, uh, our star, our sun, is going to, to erupt or burn out or something like that, and all life will cease to exist on the planet. Okay? So, ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, 
why should you live a successful life? Why should you pass anything on down to your children? And why should your children pass anything on down to their children if eventually the sun's going to fizzle out and all life is just going to be gone anyways? Now, you might say, well, we'll be space traveling at that point. But if you look at the distance between stars, no, we won't. Um, how long it takes to get from star to star, no, we won't. Um, secondly, what was the other thing he said? He used words like dogmatic and oppressive. All right. Let's just go to Dawkins, his, uh, his buddy that he quoted earlier. According to Dawkins, we live in a uh, blind, indifferent universe. There is no good. There is no evil. There's just indifference. Is, is, uh, meaningless indifference is how Dawkins puts it. So how can anything be dogmatic or oppressive if, um, if there's no standard outside of ourselves? So if there is no God, if there's no standard outside of our own opinions, then nothing is, is truly evil. Isaac can't even say that what the organization has done in the past is evil if there's no standard outside of Isaac's own opinion. Because otherwise, the organization, which is much larger than him, can say, nope, we're good. Isaac's saying, no, you're bad. What standard is Isaac referencing? What standard is an atheist referencing to say that anything is good or anything is bad, right? So we're borrowing morals from God in order to argue against his existence. And then what was the last point that he made that I really wanted to touch on? Okay, I remember now. He said the, um, the fact that anybody says I need, to, I need to look to the Bible for my morals is the most absurd thing that he's ever heard. I agree in a sense, and here's what I'm talking about. Don't click away yet. <laughs> the reason that we all have a sense of right and wrong is because God has written the Ten Commandments on our hearts. That's the, those are the two reasons that everyone knows God exists, because nature speaks out to us and we understand right from wrong via our conscience, which is given to us by God. So the fact that the majority, again, not sociopaths, but the majority of people no right from wrong. You know, when you steal something, that you shouldn't have done that. You know, when you lie, you shouldn't have done that. Like, we all understand what right and wrong is naturally because it's been given to us by God, right? But let's just let's just take a step back real quick because uh, the argument then goes, okay, well, it's not so much that it's been given to us by God, but it's just the collective. Like, the it's groupthink, right? So what does the majority want? We're going to vote on it by, by proxy of our emotions. And um, if everyone agrees that this thing is good and this thing is bad, then that's what I'm going to agree with. That's where I'm going to get my morality from. Well, here's the issue. You can go back in the past and you can see where that has been horribly, horribly, horribly flawed. Okay, At one point in our country, we, thought, we not only thought that slavery was good, but it was lawful. It was legal to own slaves in the United States. Did that make it right at any point just because it was lawful? In the United States, did that make it right at any point? At one point, it was lawful to report, or sorry, to gather up and kill Jews in Nazi Germany. Did that make it right because it was lawful, because the group decided that this thing was good? Or is it always wrong no matter what? And if it is always wrong no matter what, then it's not the group that decides the morals. It's a standard outside of the group that decides the morals. I didn't mean for this to become kind of a rebuttal against atheism, but... Again, I just have a problem when we are when we're borrowing from God's standard and his nature of truth and righteousness and justice to try and then turn back and argue against his existence. And that's exactly what Isaac is doing here. Now, I didn't foresee the video becoming this long, um, but this is like jam packed. So uh, I think there's going to be another part to this. I'm going to have to wrap it up here. So I want to thank you guys for for getting this far in the video and. You know, of course, as always, I appreciate your thoughts in the comment section. Um, hopefully, I, I sort of, I, I try and pray before every one of these videos, and I try and say the right thing, and honestly, my heart is uh, that I want to point people to to the Bible. I want to point people to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, and I want people to understand that there there is freedom in Christ that can be obtained in no other thing on the planet. No other person can you get this amount of freedom than when you are freed by the Son. Um, so I just encourage you to get into scripture, pray to God, ask him for truth and, uh, pray for the Holy Spirit to, to show you that truth. So anyways, guys, we are going to be making another part to this because I imagine I'm going to be interrupting a lot more. All right. Uh, thank you so much for watching and God bless you guys.